As promised, this week we'll be reviewing the Oxford Quarter Centenary Edition King James Version Bible. It comes in a burgundy slip case with um, the words Dominus Illuminatio Mea, the Lord is my light from Psalm 27. I think that's the motto of Oxford University on the slip case. There is the ISBN. Is it in focus? There it is. I'll take it out of the slip case. And I'll tell you that the dimensions are 10 and 15 sixteenths inches tall, 8 and 5 eighths inches wide. And I measure it to be 2 and 1 8 inches thick. You can see the gilting along the edges. So it's a gilt edge, but not art gilt give you a sense for dimensions. Here is the Young Analytical, Young's Analytical Concordance. The book is very close in size to Young's Concordance. Uh, other King James Bibles you might be interested in include the Schuyler Canterbury here which is a taller book, not as thick, not as wide. Here is a turquoise. I have only the church turquoise since I refuse to buy a red letter turquoise from Cambridge, similar in size. And this is the Allen, R.L. Allen long primer. Similar in, in footprint. The text, as in a typical King James Bible, is in two text columns. Each column here is 58 millimeters wide, and I count about a maximum of 43 characters per line. There are as many as 59 lines on a, on a column. Page dimensions are top to bottom 270 millimeters, 212 millimeters wide. That converts to 10.63 inches tall, 8.35 inches wide. The uh, print, as you can see, is a nice bold black print. It is not line matched, and it's fairly easy to see, I think. Just look. You can, I think, see that the print is offset. But the paper is sufficiently thick that I don't believe that's an issue. Margins at the top vary between 17 and 21 millimeters. For those of you used to the English system, there are 25.4 millimeters per an inch. At the bottom, it is 25 to 29 millimeters. The inner margin can be as much as 27 millimeters. Outer margin varies between 34 and 38 millimeters. The font and the text, the uppercase characters, are about 10 points, lowercase are about 9.5, line height is 3.61 millimeters, so I get 10.2 points. So the uh, line height is proportionate to the size of the capital letters. As is typical in verse-by-verse -verse Bibles, verse numbers are alongside the verses. The words that the translators add for clarity are in italic font. Old Testament quotations in the New Testament are not in a special font as they would be, say, in the New American Standard Bible. You find alongside the text both references and translation notes. So references will be typically indicated by an asterisk. as here, here, and here. Translation notes are indicated either by these parallel lines, and those are usually for an or type note, or for a note that, that indicates what the original language says, you'll see a dagger or cross. I mentioned the paper. It uh, is nice and non-shiny paper, a matte surface. Sheet thickness is 56.7 micrometers, so I estimate the paper weight at 52 GSM. Paper is white with a slight yellow tinge. There is noticeable show through, but it is not bothersome. So you can see some here. 
the bottom of the page to help you read smoothly from one page to the next. Catch words are printed. There are no book introductions. The print uni non-uniformity is slight. Book titles are in the center top of the left-hand page. Page contents, the only page contents you get are for the right page, which gives you a clue as to how far how deep you are into the book. There are no page numbers in this book. There are headings that run along the top. So we see here Samson's marriage, his riddle, his fox tails, his jawbone, which gives you a clue as to where you are in terms of the subject matter of the book. Chapter numbers are not in a large font at the beginning of the first verse, but instead they're here between the uh, chapters in Roman numerals. There are decorative initial letters for each chapter. Books do not begin on a separate page. I'll show you that. We'll just quickly go back here to the beginning of the book of Leviticus, which is inserted on the same page as the end of Exodus. Another thing that uh, is interesting here is that instead of uh, the long S, which you'll find here in things like this title and on the headings that run along the top of the page, in the text itself you don't see the long S, you see the modern S instead. I think if there is one flaw with this edition, it's that, in my mind. I would have preferred to see the archaic S where it's appropriate. If you go to the New Testament, you will find that the words of Christ are happily in black. I say that because printing red letters seems to be a challenge to printers. The contrast is low. The letters are often offset from the black. Um, they don't cover the black as well on the opposite side of the page, so the show-through problem is sometimes enhanced. So for various reasons, I prefer black ink Bibles. Unlike those King James editions that I showed earlier when I was doing the size comparisons, this one does include the King James Version Apocrypha. So here we're in First Esdras, and here's another example of where the heading includes the long S which is absent from the text itself. At the end of the Bible, at the end of the book of Revelation, the only really significant material that's remaining is uh, an essay by Gordon Campbell. Gordon Campbell is the author of this book uh, that I did a book report on earlier. and. Um, he mentions here that this is, he thinks, the most authentic edition of the King James Bible to have been published since the first edition of 1611, and um, notes the difference that this is in Roman type rather than black letter. Um, he says this uh, origins of this go back as far as 1833 when Oxford University Press first published a Roman type edition and that the difference here are in the chapter, um, initial letters in the chapters. And that would explain why um, the Nelson edition that I have, which is essentially the same book in an eight-point font, has uh, different initial letters. Let's see if we can look here. So here's the one in the Nelson edition for chapter 22 of Revelation. That's the pattern there, and the Oxford Quarter Centenary Edition. So they're both decorative, but you can see the illustrated pattern is different. The essay here has some useful information in it, uh, among other things. But on the translation itself, the work of the translation, and then some information for people who might find this, reading this older style of English difficult. He talks about V's and U's and how they were formed in those days. Um, the use of the J versus the I. Um, the um, tilde over a letter to indicate an abbreviation. 
and so on. He does talk about the uh, long S here, and the Y with a E over it, which was uh, meant to indicate the, the old letter Thorn. Mentions what he calls uh, paraphs, this symbol here. How those divide uh, divide paragraphs. And there's a section here on errata. These are printers' errors that they have left uncorrected in this edition. So there are things like uh, misspelling of desired. First Kings nine nineteen. Um, this should have been House of Jeroboam rather than House Jeroboam, etc. He doesn't include all of the printer's errors, but just some of the more significant ones from that first edition. And then it's a normal sort of uh, hardback paste mat down binding, a book with decorative head and tail bands. So they're burgundy, and as you can see, there are ribbon markers. I have one of them tucked in, one of them hanging loose. They are 40.9 centimeters long, uh, but only 6 millimeters wide, so they're fairly thin, skinny uh, ribbon markers, but they're shiny on both sides. The um, book has its own binding. It lo lo lies flat just about anywhere you open it to. It lies flat in Genesis, it lies flat here in the center, and unlike many Bibles, because there's so much marginal room here, the text is staying far out of the gutter, so that the text of the Bible that you're reading is fairly flat. That is a problem for people with older eyes who have magnifying lenses that give them a shallow depth of focus. All right, uh, in the front of the book, what we have here, there's a bit of material here in the front. The front binding is similar to the back. You have a title page for this quarter centenary edition. Uh, copyright information printed in China. The ISBN again. And this is the facsimile of the 1611 edition. So these are the contents of the facsimile. Here is uh, title page from the original 1611 King James Version. Here is the um, epistle dedicatory. This is uh, thought to be by Thomas Bilson. So this is the dedication to the king who was James I of England, ruled 1603 to 1625. Here's the translators to the readers rather reader singular. This is known to be written by a fellow named Miles Smith. And then after that you have a number of other interesting things. There's a uh, calendar. This is showing readings for morning and evening prayer per month. So this is for January, which has 31 days. It gives you sunrise and sunfall times, so it would be interesting to know the latitude and longitude of that location that they chose. Perhaps Greenwich, uh, similar for February and March. So the Church of England, which translated the King James Bible, is and was a liturgical church. And there were set readings for every day of the year, for morning and evening prayer also set readings for communion. There's an almanac. And this uh, gives you the uh, dates of Easter and the holy days that are connected to the date of Easter, like um, Septuagesima, first day of Lent, Lent, the people who um, translated the King James Bible were concerned about when Lent starts, Rogation Weeks, Ascension Day, Whit Sunday, which is also known as Pentecost, and Advent. Advent's the beginning of the church year. There's a, a table for calculating Easter. One of these days I may do a video on how to calculate Easter using the material at the beginning of the Book, and, Book of Common Prayer. A table and calendar 
setting out the order of the psalms and lessons to be said at morning and evening prayer. It's telling you how many weeks before Easter septagesima start, sexagesima, quinquagesima, and quad quadragesima start. And it gives you the Roman numeral for the number of weeks before. These are to be observed for holy days. The translators of the King James Version worked in a church in which um, St. Peter the Apostle had a holy day dedicated to him. Uh, the circumcision of our Lord was a holy day. Epiphany was a holy day. The nativity of our Lord, Christmas Day, was a holy day. There was a day holy to St. Stephen the Martyr. They also baptized infants. The King James Version translators did. Here's a table of contents for the books of the Old and the New Testament. And Old Testament books, as you can see, the apocryphal books are included, and the New Testament books. After the table of contents, you come to the Great Seal of the Realm, also known as the Royal Seal of the United Kingdom. It has written on it, uh, God in my right, which is the motto of the British monarch. Here around the shield in the center is written, Shame on him who thinks evil of it. And it indicates that it's uh, by the privilege of the king's majesty. That is, the book is authorized to be printed. That seal is essentially the seal that you find on Cambridge Bibles. This is my interlinear King James uh, Revised Version Bible. So after the royal great seal, you come to genealogies, and these are genealogies of characters in the Bible. There are 35 pages of these genealogies, starting with Adam and Eve and Garden, and going on page after page. After the genealogies, we come to a map index for this two-page map of the Holy Land, a map of Canaan. Unfortunately, it does go into the gutter, and so we lose a little information right in there. And then the second page of the map index leads you up to the first book of Moses, also called Genesis. We will move on now to the portion of the video where we do font comparisons. I will begin with the Thomas Nelson 1611 facsimile. And as you can see, the Nelson has a smaller font, not printed as darkly. This is about 10 points on the left, about 8 points on the right. The um, Nelson has the different uh, initial capital letters we saw. Uh, one of the things I have noticed that's different is that the Nelson text seems to be a bit cleaner. There are some blotch marks that I find in the Oxford text that seem to have been erased in the Nelson text on the right. Now we have the Allen Long Primer on the right, and it is uh, clearly a more cleanly printed text with larger characters. Also, it's altogether modern in terms of its uh, print and spelling. So this would, of course, be easier to read on the right than on the left, but you would have a slightly less genuine feel because King James Bible was, of course, printed like this, although not in 1611, but I think in 1612 or 13, it was printed in Roman type. Now I have the Church Bible Publishers uh, turquoise on the right, and again, it's a larger font on the right, perhaps a bit easier to read, but less in terms of authenticity if you're interested in getting into the spirit of the early 17th century. And now coming in from the right is the Schuyler Canterbury with its uh, red verse numbers and its uh, decorative characters beginning each chapter. Uh, they are printed in red as well. I'll show you that in a minute. Just looking now, the print is of course larger and crisper and cleaner on the right in that modern font, uh, but it's less bold. It has always struck me as being a bit on the thin side. Now let me show you the uh, decorative character here. So this is a decorative T, starting Genesis chapter 29. 
I mentioned in the font comparisons that the Nelson 1611 reproduction sometimes clears up blotches that this Oxford you're looking at now does not. So here's sort of a mark, a little blob of dark ink uh, right below Noah in Genesis chapter 7. If we look at the same spot in the Thomas Nelson edition, I suspect is based on that same 1833 Oxford Bible. You'll see that they've cleaned it up. And so far, every place I've found a blotch like that in the Oxford, when I look in the Nelson, it's cleaner. But I actually prefer reading the Oxford because it's a darker text and also a bit larger, two points larger than this Nelson. Earlier in the video, we took a look at this section of the preliminary information that talks about the various readings throughout the year for morning and evening prayer. And just uh, in case you're not familiar with what morning and evening prayer were like, in case you have the sense that perhaps they were informal prayers, I wanted to show you what those looked like at the time. Here we have the Book of Common Prayer that was authorized under Queen Elizabeth. There was a modification to this Book of Common Prayer early in um, King James's reign, but the modifications were quite minor. So this will give you a good sense, I think, for what morning prayer was like. That these, this is the sort of service that these translators conducted. Um, the order for morning prayer throughout the year. The minister would begin by reading one of these sentences from Scripture. Then this introductory statement here, a general confession by the whole congregation kneeling. So everyone would say this confession that goes to the top of this page. Then the minister would pronounce absolution. The people would all answer amen. I'm sure they pronounced it that way too and not amen. Then they would say the Our Father. Then, um, O oh Lord, open thou our lips, and the answer is, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. They would sing the psalm, Psalm 95, sad or song, following the psalms in the order that they're appointed. There would then be the two lessons that we saw in the table, the first of the Old Testament, the second of the New. And after the first lesson, this uh, little hymn would be said, We praise thee, O Lord, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord, all the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting, and so far forth. Or this canticle. A little tricky turning the pages after the second lesson. Um, they would say the Benedictus which is this, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, or this psalm, O be joyful in the Lord all ye lands, and serve the Lord with gladness. Then the creed, said by the minister and the people standing. After that, these prayers following, as well at evening and morning prayer, all devoutly kneeling, Lord, have mercy on us. So this is the Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. And then these words and responses following three colics. Colics are these short prayers. And the service would be over. Well, we will uh, conclude now the. Uh, the video review with just a brief summary. It's a rather large King James Bible. It has uh, nice advantages. It's sewn, it lies flat, the print is nice and dark. Uh, it almost gets you into the feeling of the times with the archaic spelling and the use of U's for V's and V's for U's, that sort of thing. But it doesn't have the long S, uh, which I'm a little bit disappointed about. Paper is wonderful, it's opaque, it's not shiny, 
And the only negative, I think, really negative, serious negative about it is the, uh, the size. This is not something that you're about to carry to church, and you need a large area, a free area somewhere in which to read it. I doubt you'll want to be able to, you'll, I doubt you'll be able to read it in bed. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, uh, not only the Bible, but the little bit that I added there to give you a sense for the way they worshipped in the uh, early 17th century. Appreciate your watching. If you feel so inclined, remember to hit the subscribe button. And uh, thank you very much.